The Whitbread, the most grueling event in all of sport. 32,000 miles of ocean racing round the world, nine months before the mast. It's a nautical marathon that demands endurance, confidence, toughness, stamina, racing skill and resourcefulness. Just finishing is an accomplishment. Keeping boat, body and mind together over the long months at sea is the essence of winning and survival. With just minutes separating boats after thousands of miles, crews are in race mode 24 hours a day from start to finish. That's why the world's best sailors are attracted to this ultimate test of seamanship. Once you've been touched by the Whitbread, life is never the same. The great clipper ships established the routes and provided the challenge that inspired the Whitbread. It began in 1973 with 19 pioneer adventurers right out of a Joseph Conrad novel. They sailed a variety of sturdy old ocean cruisers and a few new designs were built for the race. The average speed, around seven and a half knots. In 1977, Dutch industrialist Cornelius van Rieschoten brought new professionalism to the Whitbread, winning in his first outing. In 1981, he built a new maxi and took preparation and training to new levels. His second flyer established an enviable mark, winning the race on handicap and taking line honors. Then in 1989, sailing in his fifth race, New Zealand skipper Peter Blake set a pace so hot it can only be equal. Steinlager II won all six legs of the race, setting course records and winning the overall trophy. Blake and Steinlager became household names in New Zealand and on the waterfronts of the world. This year's fleet will challenge Steinlager's records. There's a new generation of fast maxis and a new class designed and built for this race, the Whitbread 60 with the potential to beat the Maxis boat for boat. New Zealand Endeavour, the front runner, a thing of beauty, and the last of the great Whitbread Maxis skippered by Grant Dalton. This time, he is obsessed with winning. Merit Cup, the ride for five-time veteran Pia Feldman, who is unhappy with the boat, says it won't surf, but Merit has won two legs and could take it all. Yamaha, first to develop out of a two-bow program, Skipper Ross Field, watch captain on Steinlager 2, taking command. Yamaha, an early favorite. Interim Justicia, the speed demon, the record breaker. Skipper Laurie Smith, the free spirit, caution to the winds, in the hunt to the very end. Tokyo, so fast, so perfect. World Match Race Champion Chris Dixon confidently leading the 60 through four legs until bad luck spoiled a storybook ending. Galicia 93 Pescanova, winner of the 93 Fastnet race, on the pace under skipper Javier de la Gandra, a fiercely driven competitor. Winston, skipper Dennis Connor, the biggest name in world sailing, an early favorite after winning the Transatlantic, but it wasn't to be. What went wrong? Much has changed in the last 20 years from the first Whitbread, not only with the type of boats being used, but Gary, the sailors who are participating and now. Peter, many of these sailors are America's Cup and Olympians that are pushing these boats to the absolute limit. So now we have a marathon being sailed as though it's a sprint. Back in 1977, the yacht Condor broke the record for distance sails in 24 hours, sailing 307 miles. Now today, these boats are regularly sailing over 400 miles. From the tough adventurers back in 1973, here for the sixth wet bread, it's Formula One Grand Prix racing around the world and the sailors living without any boundaries. Leg one of the wet bread takes the fleet down the Atlantic to Punta del Este, Uruguay. Leg two, the longest, 7,500 miles of gale force winds, huge seas and icebergs. Leg three, a sprint, 3,300 miles from Fremantle to Auckland. Leg four, back to the Southern Ocean, around Cape Horn to Punta del Este. Leg five, past Brazil, across the equator and into Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Finally, leg six, back across the Atlantic to the finish in Southampton. Aboard HMS Southampton, the Duke of York takes trigger in hand. The spectator fleet looks like the evacuation of England. And Chris Dixon is first off the line. 
The crew of Brooksfield and Italian 60 will be severely tested before this race is over. And for Dolphins' young crew, average age 21, the Whitbread will be a hard score. If it floats, it's on to Solent this day. The spectator wash is a big factor. Hitman Sahadashny, one of two Ukrainian entries. The French Postal Service is hauling the mail on the Maxi La Poste. An express delivery? It's a great day on the Solent. Peter, the Whitbread 60s, grabbed the initiative at the start as the fleet splits. With the wind astern, the hot pace continues across the Bay of Biscay. And there's wind aplenty. The fleet enjoys the first heavy weather of the race. It's time to shake down and work out the kinks. This is just the prelude to what the Southern Ocean will have to offer. The first casualty, Fortuna, with a broken mizzen. The Spanish owners withdraw from the race for Skipper Larry Smith's bitter disappointment. The same day, Brooksfield put in the breast with a broken rudder. It would cost them 20 hours. Next on the growing list of breakdowns is La Paste. Four days into the race, the French Maxi broached and badly twisted the mizzen mast. The crew applies a jury rig, but the mast is useless in wind over 10 knots. La Paz struggles on. Back in Southampton, a second Ukrainian entry, Odessa, starts a week late after her sail across from Florida. Odessa will arrive in Uruguay in time for the start of League Two. Past the entrance to the Mediterranean, the boats snake their way into the doldrums. Endeavour closes on the leading six. Now abiding right over the last uh, 18 hours, wind up to 30 knots, knowing that we've had to cram as much sail on as possible to hold on to the lighter 60 footers and to stay in the front row of the grid. We seem to have been able to hang on just by uh, cramming every bit of canvas we can on and just hanging on from death and watching the rigs and just keeping we don't sure we don't break everything. The stern of Endeavour, Yamaha. Skipper Ross Field is enjoying the ride. Here we are, 200 miles off the Portuguese coast, and we're running along at 25 to 30 knots of wind, an average boat speed of about 17 knots. And over the last six hours, we averaged uh, five miles, which gives us a 420 mile day, so we're making very, very good progress. Not everyone is enjoying Yamaha's breeze. On merit, the light sails come out. Oh, well, this... With the new rudder in place, Brooksfield is a day behind, working hard to catch the fleet. On Winston, Whitbread rookie Dennis Connor is getting into the rhythm of the race. The uh, racing so far has been interesting from the standpoint that the fleet has had quite a difference of opinion as to uh, what direction to go. On race leader Tokyo, the Brain Trust makes its first big decision to head south for the quickest route through the doldrums. Chances are, first boat out will be first to finish. The rising temperature and the diminishing winds are sure signs the doldrums are approaching. Now the crews, sweltering in tropical heat and humidity, work hard to keep up their concentration and momentum. We've got a bit of a crisis today, because my fan's not there. The mystery of Merritt's long case of the slows was finally unraveled. A diver found a net wrapped around the keel. Skipper Pierre Feldman didn't like it. All we really needed was an even hand dealt for some Dolphins, but uh, well, we haven't had an even hand. Compared to the other boats, Dolphin's hand didn't look too bad. Like the ancient mariner, boats can be becalmed here for days. 
Yamaha enjoys a sudden burst. The crew responds, hoping this will be their slingshot out of the doldrums. It looks promising, but it's just a frustrating tease. Yamaha stops as the doldrums holds its breath once more. Endeavour, first to sail into the vacuum, then the fleet ran them down. The doldrums are the lair of King Neptune. When disturbed, he abuses the luckless newcomers with his foul concoctions and mean games. Equator initiations can test friendships. Free at last, the boats break clear of the doldrums and bend sail to the southeast trades. Endeavour leads the drag race, which gets wild as the wind builds to gale force. Hard running conditions off Brazil, there were no passing lanes. The fleet was left to follow in the tracks of Tokyo and Endeavour. A day out from the finish, Winston was caught in a 50 knot gust that laid the boat over and broke a boom. Gone were Winston's chances of finishing in the top of a class. Tokyo's tactics into and through the doldrums are the key to their strong showing. They lie second to Endeavour. We're only about uh, 15 miles out of Punta now and uh, coming in at, at speed. Full sides uh, spinnakers up and uh, they see the land of uh, Uruguay ahead of us. It's been 25 days, a long 25 days. This afternoon Tokyo's caught us up a bunch more, but we're going to make it. New Zealand Endeavour, first to Punta del Este. Breaking Steinlager's record by a day and a half. <laughs> Just three hours later and well within Steinlager's previous leg record, Chris Dixon takes the Heineken Trophy in the 60 class. Well, we've got a great team of guys on board. They've worked incredibly hard for nearly a month now, so we're happy. We've got a good boat, a fantastic team, and uh, they've worked hard, so, yeah. New Zealand Endeavour lived up to their pre-race favouritism, an eight-hour cushion over Merit Cup. In the 60s, Tokyo has really set the standard. Ten hours ahead of Galicia and a big fright for Yamaha and Winston. Dolphin and Youth had the second group of 60s, while Odessa's late start accounts for their deficit. Overall, the big interest in Tokyo's second spot, look out New Zealand Endeavour. Yamaha set the 24-hour record. Winston limps to the finish line without a mainsail. The broken boom slows the boat to a crawl. We went over and uh, blew out our spinnaker and uh, ripped the main, took the sails down and uh, put things back together, started with a storm jib and worked our way back uh, up to uh, pretty much full speed. Mitchum disappointed not living up to pre-race predictions. Skipper Roger Nielsen says the speed is there. This boat has the potential, especially downwind, uh, to beat uh, the other boats uh, if we sail it well. The faces of the U.S. Women's Challenge reflect the simmering descent that plagued the boat. But skipper Nance Frank in her back has cited a lack of funds as the reason they were withdrawing from the race. The wild welcome for Uruguay Natural includes President Lacau. Their boat was old and off the pace, but this is coming home. The Women's Challenge gets new life and a new skipper, Whitbread veteran Dawn Riley. Yeah, I can't say that this is the ideal way of doing the Whitbread, jumping in with only a few days to go. And uh, crew, the crew's not a problem. The boat, we're getting everything together. Obviously, there was work held up with the transition and everything. But um, it's not ideal, but it is Whitbread, and it is another challenge, and we're going for it. Another skipper change. Shipwrecked Laurie Smith sails again, on interim this time, for injured Roger Nilsson. At this time of the year, the Pampero storms blow through regularly. Angry surf pounds the beach and crashes against the breakwater that only gives limited protection to the fleet, as healed at its moorings. The crews watched with apprehension. This sailor learned that it's not only dogs that make friends with lampposts. Leg two, the most demanding where the crews will experience the most exhilarating and frightening moments. 
Racing in the Southern Ocean is the essence of the Whitbread. It's the challenge. You haven't done the Whitbread until you've sailed the Southern Ocean. The key issue is the tactical quandary. How far south and for how long before heading north again to round Prince Edward Island? As the yachts plunge south into the roaring 40s, the crews start to experience the debilitating cold. They sail south around the high pressure zone to get into those strong westerlies of legend. The crews live with discomfort as they keep the pedal down. Oh, the floor's are wet, the, the ceiling's wet, the, everything's wet, but the bunks are still dry. If it keeps on going like this, so we're going to have wet bunks as well, so it's um, a bit like a rainforest down here. Pretty rugged couple of days, up to 40 knots of breeze, reaching. Um, the first time the decks have even have been anything like dry in the last uh, the last few days. It's down. It's now getting pretty cold. It's probably uh, close to zero. Uh, but we've got a spinnaker up. The sustained heavy reaching takes its toll. Nobody likes downtime, but in these conditions, boats and bodies are often bruised and broken. A bit of excitement on the boat today. Kind of. Surfing along in about 15 with 20 knots of wind, Barrett up the rig trying to rig the new main halyard. Adrian halfway up the rig on her way up there. A little BBC came through, flew about 25, 27, 30. Got up to uh, 34, it's a bit of a handful, not much seas to surf on. 37 hit and uh, she took off. Hit going about 22, we did a little broach. Uh, thank God the Martin Breaker came down, came off, and uh, the Spinnaker came down, and everybody was okay, but Merritt has a good story to tell her grandkids. Ice, the Southern Ocean's greatest hazard. Some bergs are larger than great ships, breathtaking, the sailor's worst nightmare. And small growlers broken off pieces are at times impossible to detect. At night time, icebergs all get up and go back to the South Pole. And we know that because during the day, we'd see, we probably saw 20 or 30 icebergs, big ones, small ones, at night time, blasting along, doing 20 knots of boat speed. It's, it's sleet and snow, spray flying. You can hardly see the front of the boat, let alone 100 meters in front. We never saw a single iceberg at night. Past the halfway mark, Endeavour is first around Prince Edward Island, but a pack of 60s is not far behind. Atrium is next around, easing sheets toward Fremantle, 3,500 miles away. The island is shrouded in fog and mystery as Interim speeds past. Soon after routing Prince Edward Island, disaster befalls Endeavour. The boat tripped on a wave, broached, and a flick of the churning sea took 10 metres off the mizzen mast. For Grant Dalton, deja vu. On leg one of the 89 race, a failed mizzen cost him 12 hours, which he never recovered. He wrote in his log, I have trouble describing how I feel. My throat is dry, my body is numb, my world has fallen down around me. The chance of winning all six legs in our ride, which was almost my dream, is gone forever, I'm afraid. Endeavour's cast of legends showed their stuff, re-rigging what they had left. After rounding Prince Edward Island, Interim dies south fast while the fleet follows the Great Circle route. The call by navigator Marcel Van Tries to take Interim south is inspired. Pushed by strong westerly gales, Interim sets a new world record for a monohole yacht, 425 miles in 24 hours. Dolphin and Youth's young crew was also pushing hard to join the 400 club, which now included Tokyo and Galicia. 
Then the runner tried to tear off the boat. They lashed it in place, but it wasn't enough. So they hove to and tackled the problem while rolling in big seas. Stop the pipe and pull two weeks into the main, but let's blow the boat right down now. And uh, we have to make our way to Kadulan Islands to effect some repair to get us into Fremantle. This will not last uh, the uh, 3,000 miles to go. They haul the rudder and make repairs. To put it back in place, Skipper Humphrey spends minutes in the cold water. Meanwhile, Brooksfield is in trouble deep in the southern ocean. During a gale, the rudder breaks free, chafing a large hole in the boat. Three tons of water floods the aft compartment, knocking out all electronics. Skipper Guido Mesto triggers an SOS signal and the crew gets to work, bailing for their lives. It's a dangerous situation. Working up to their knees in freezing water, the crew makes progress. Finally stuffing a bucket into the hole. It's a tense battle. All this time, they could only hope their call has been heard. Aboard Endeavour, Dalton coordinates the search. Go back, Well, you need to, you know, but well, we're ready to go now. Uh, we should go, we should go. Winston turns back into the teeth of the gale. What followed is the worst night of Skipper Brad Butterworth's life. Bashing through huge seas, La Poste finally finds the stricken vessel after 12 hours. It's a great piece of navigation. The relief is felt round the world. Was the distress call necessary after all? The post watch captain, Ya Kabakadis. It was long 50 knots. They had the rudder moving and breaking the hull. They had three tons of water inside the boat. And it's up to them to decide. And no one, not even us, very close to the same conditions, could decide if they should or not switch it off. After a lull, the gale continues to rage. The post hoves two and 60 knots and stands by Brooksfield for several hours. Interim dive south not only gives her a new record, but a substantial lead as the fleet bends north toward Australia. Merritt Cup keeps the hammer down in pursuit of her injured rival Endeavour. And she makes it. Under full sail, Merritt closes the gap and eases past Endeavour. First in the Fremantle, Interim sails a brilliant tactical race without mishap. Laurie Smith finds a key to Interim's potential. We, we sailed well, went the right way, you know, good crew, good boats, and um, everything went well for us, yeah. Tokyo is second, just two hours back. Dixon extends his overall fleet lead. Uh, it was tough, it was long, it was cold, and um, the hardest part is you're a boat race, and it'd be very easy to, to throttle back and take it easy and go slow, but you know that others aren't. Yamaha third to Fremantle. On the pace to Prince Edward Island, they slip back on the second half of the leg and they fall 15 hours behind Tokyo. Merritt wins the maxi class by 90 minutes, passing Endeavour two days from the finish. Pierre Fellman happily hoists his Heineken trophy. Brooksfield is a sight for sore eyes, especially for skipper Guido Maestro's girlfriend. These resourceful sailors have conquered huge obstacles to arrive at the finish line. <laughs> Despite the mass break, New Zealand Endeavour still leads by six and a half hours. Winston jumps to second after being given 21 hours redress for the Brooksfield rescue, while Interim smashes Steinlager 2's leg record by a day and a half and moves to third. Brooksfield heads the second group of 60s despite the drama, and Dolphin's rudder problems drop them to ninth. Tokyo takes the top spot just over three hours ahead of New Zealand Endeavour, while Interim sets a new world monohull record for 24 hours. In Fremantle, the all-women's campaign dons new colours for their boat and earns a new name, Heineken. Skipper Dawn Riley understands the pros and cons of her crew. The only advantage of an all-women's team is that you have a little more of something that holds you together. 
and it's maybe a little more of an example for other people. Disadvantage, the obvious one is strength. 12 women are not going to weigh the same, be as strong, and have the same experience as 12 men. But there are individual women that can, working in a team, hold their own just as well with a group of guys. Another skipper change. French sailing legend Eric Tabali joins La Paste. As Connor leaves for the start of leg three, he's not happy. Winston's 21 hours of redress is under appeal. Leg three is tactically demanding, especially approaching the tip of New Zealand. The 60s line up after the start in a fresh breeze. After just two legs, these speedsters have already left an indelible mark on the Whitbread. The weather map shows light headwinds off Fremantle and some enticing westerlies to the south. And that's just where Dennis Connor is headed. The rest of the fleet stays to the north while Connor dives deep. Winston makes the hard running conditions its own. We're headed south to pick up a uh, bit more wind, and if it turns out to be the thing to do. We'll be uh, heroes, and if it doesn't work out, we'll be saying that the weatherman doesn't know what he's talking about. So far, so good. Boat speed 17 knots. Back further north, for the bulk of the fleet, it's light, fluky and frustrating. Winston's lead extends to 140 miles before it's caught in a weather trap. The fleet brings the wind up from astern. A fresh northerly coming from Central Australia brings new power and life to the Maxis. Merritt Cup pushes hard, a bit too hard. Merritt sails closer and closer to the wind with the spinnaker up until something gives. On the Whitbread 60s, Tokyo leads the pack that is surfing behind northerlies that are getting stronger by the hour. On Yamaha, Rossfield's crew is reveling in the power reaching. And on Dolphin, the daily grind is rewarded with speeds in excess of 20 knots. Winston is running out of wind as the marauding pack closes in. Now it's our turn to experience the same light air situation. So this will have a big outcome now in the rest of the race because as we're sitting here going five knots, the other guys are catching up quite quickly. So it depends upon if they can catch up as much as we gain, what the outcome will be. Into the Tasman Sea, an interim nearly breaks its brand new record. Smith credits the boat's speed to superior helmsmen and the fact they carry spinnakers in 40 knots. Interim and Yamaha steal to the east looking for more wind, but they get caught. The wind comes ahead and they're unable to round the tip of New Zealand without tacking. Out of the pack, once again, it's Tokyo. Sailing into the rising sun off the top of New Zealand, leading the fleet. Winston does well consolidating its position after losing a huge initial lead. After almost two weeks, 3,000 miles, as we approach the windward end, north end of uh, the island of New Zealand, that uh, there's three or four boats that can still win this race. If we get a little uh, lift here in the next couple of hours, we'll be uh, rounding the top right with the New Zealand Endeavor and Tokyo, and it should be a uh, great sprint to the finish. Second to the top of New Zealand off Cape Rianga Endeavour. Dalton and Kevin Shoebridge show the stress of trying to be first into their hometown, while Dennis Connor rides the rail and hopes for that wind shift. Yamaha is looking for wind shifts and playing the tricky currents in this navigator's minefield. Winston Wright lines up with Galicia and Yamaha. It looks like a day race. La Paz joins the scramble. Skipper Eric Tabley has lifted this boat's performance. 
Tokyo leads Endeavour around the Cape and down the Northland coast of New Zealand. The light air and all the sail area is helping the Maxi reel in the smaller boat. It's a storybook ending to this leg as two local international sailing heroes are dueling to be first to arrive home. Is there time for Endeavour to pass? Into the mass of spectator boats whose running lights look like a blanket of stars. Ten miles away, Auckland glows like a colossal midway. Endeavour's light sails are ghosting her down the channel. Into the flat still water, the smaller Tokyo is nearly stopped. And Endeavour keeps momentum and wins it. Tokyo, just two minutes behind. There is nothing quite like an Auckland welcome to the Whitbread fleet. It's 3 a.m., 100,000 sailing fanatics cheer on the dramatic last moments. The jubilant celebration is unique. This has to be the city of sails. My son, we will well, die, really, of our, most of our lives. So, you know, we were close all the time. We couldn't quite get there. We got really close to the North End. Mike and, and Glenn and the boys called some great tactics we got through. But also congratulations to Chris and the Tokyo crew. They're brilliant. They did an absolutely fantastic job and they easily could have been here. For Dalton, it was an overall fleet win. For Dixon, the Maxis aren't part of his game. At the Heineken Trophy presentation, he made this perfectly clear. The Maxis are so much faster. We've seen that. For us to be in front of Endeavour even for part of the race was a humorous to us to be so close to beating them over the line was kind of funny so we um, were out there to race with red 60s and to come so close was fun to beating endeavor but really to us uh, not as important as it was to them dixon's rancor escalates at a later press conference and continues to echo throughout new zealand even after he publicly apologizes to grant dalton winston is second in class Connor sails into bad news, reversal of redress from the Brooksfield rescue, and an addition of four hours slipped them back to third overall. It's a huge advantage for New Zealand Endeavour, 15 hours over Merit Cup, the others right off the pace. Tokyo's 17 and a half hour lead over Yamaha in second looks impregnable. Dolphin and Youth is 10 days behind. Two Whitbread 60s are now in the top three of overall calculations. Yamaha displaces Merit Cup for third. With so many New Zealanders among Whitbread crews, the parting at Auckland Harbour before the start of League Four is bittersweet. thousand fans gather to watch the start. Many recall the last race and a boat named the Card. The strongest memories of this incident are held by skippers like Ross Field. Oh, we just have to take it on the day, but you know, we're going to be very conservative. We can't afford to. Um have any prangs or any dings or anything so we're going to be very conservative and hopefully uh, the race committee got us totally sorted to police the area. I'm sure they have. As this leg begins the sailors have but one thought rounding Cape Horn. The charge for the starting line is on with a big bulge in the middle of the line. Peter they look early several boats are over early. They're turning back. Winston, Yamaha, Galicia, Intra, Merit Cup. Eight of them have been recalled. More than half the fleet. That's a Whitbread record. Meanwhile, Endeavour is stretching out after a clean start. Somewhere among that stampede is the Whitbread fleet. The Tokyo is amazing, still mistake free. Heineken is crossing Endeavour after being over early, deciding to sail on and take the penalty. 
an injury on Heineken. Sailmaker Leah Newbold's left hand got pulled through a winch. Fortunately, there's a medic on board. Newbold's painful hand requires 17 stitches, but she'd probably be back on watch rotation in a week. They're tough, these Whitbread sailors. As the fleet leaves New Zealand, a big glow is gathering that should loose a blast of pressure from the west. It's the fourth successive start into heavy conditions. Craving more speed runs, Intrim heads south. It's 60s weather. Past East Cape, the fleet is struck by a river of wind that pushes it away from New Zealand at a record rate, with Intrim setting the pace. Yamaha's crew is driving hard on its way to a 417-mile run in 24 hours. And Galicia is logging 419 miles. Interim is still the speed king, sustaining its blistering pace and breaking its own world record. Bond in 28 miles. In 24 hours, which uh, broke our pass record of 4.25, so everyone was very happy with that. Um, it didn't seem as hard as uh, the first time we broke the record. I guess the conditions were um, a little easier, I suppose. It's wet and frantic on deck, but there's no refuge below. The daily routine is a study in humour, compatibility and tolerance. Can I get a clean? Your wardrobe is a sail bag. Sleep is where you find it, but total exhaustion makes it possible. The food is freeze dried, no tables are available. Cleanup is big fun. It's best not to get sick. Recreation, not much time for that. Worst is the endless wrestling match with gear. So many layers, everything wet, sticky, and heavy. Coffee helps. All the time, the boat pitching, knocking you around. And humor, don't forget humor. <laughs> because back on deck, it's even worse. In the frigid southern ocean, the Whitbread becomes an ordeal comparable to climbing the Himalayas. The cold is numbing. Exhaustion stalks the sailors. Stamina goes to breaking point and beyond. Headwinds as it closes on Cape Horn. The Dolphin crew hears noise from the keel, a bad sign. Once again, Matt Humphreys dies. The problem? Three keel bolts have sheared off. This is not a situation that promotes peace of mind. Okay, at the moment, we have still 1,100 miles to Cape Horn, which is nearest land. And uh, from Cape Horn, it's still 1,400 miles up to the lesson. So we're concerned about the time that's left in the race to get back to Punta. Um, so we have to take safety precautions, and that includes having all the safety gear, players' grab bags, life rafts, now ready on deck. Everybody is now sleeping around the main hatchway, um, just in case of any emergency. Cape Horn, the most famous sailor's nemesis, where gales blow through every four days. It's a bleak land's end at the bottom of South America. The valleys behind the Cape provide a frontier existence for gauchos. Cape Horn, where all living things bend to the will of the wind. Well, here it is, folks, the most famous landmark in the world, Cape Horn at the bottom of South America, 
the most famous milestone for Mariners. And the first jump to reach here from Auckland is in from Justitia. And just a little further over the ocean, 10 miles back, is New Zealand Endeavour. Interim leads the sixth Whitbread fleet out of the Southern Ocean, following in the wakes of Magellan, Drake, and other great adventurers. Cape Horn has not lived up to its fearsome reputation this day. It's the calm after the storm as the boats converge on the Cape for the remaining 1,200 miles to Punta del Este. Behind Interim, Endeavour is escorted by a frigate from the Chilean Navy. The Kiwis were relieved to finally bid farewell to the Southern Ocean. You're just talking to a few friends here. Can you really, really say you and the crew have enjoyed the Southern Ocean leg? No, we haven't, and everybody's shaking their head around me so they approve of what I'm saying. We haven't enjoyed this leg, but you know, as I've said, it's like, a bit like going to the Southern Ocean, it's a bit like going to the dentist. You don't enjoy it, you've got to go there every now and again to, to, do, to live on with life, and it's part of the Whitbread race, and uh, it'd be fair to say we're pretty happy that we're actually leaving it. The Yamaha team has sailed well consistently. They're the second 60-footer to round the Cape. Just three miles further back in Drake's Passage is 60-class leader Tokyo. As they pass the Falkland Islands, Intram holds her lead with Endeavour on her tail and the pack of Tokyo, Yamaha, and Galicia leading Maricup. And then, it's Intram's turn to run out of air. This crew, so adept at hard running, nurses the boat along to maintain headway. Well, there we are, 600 miles from the finish, which uh, for some people 600 miles is probably the longest race they do. It's uh, equivalent to a fast net race. In wet bread terms, we're quite close to the finish and um, it's getting quite frustrating. We've got a, a healthy lead, but we're quite worried about it with the, uh, the light airs. You never know if the others are gaining at uh, twice the speed that you're doing. So it's all frustrating, a bit nerve-wracking, but uh, here we are in the final stages of leg four. Endeavour is on the horizon now. The crew take bearings on the big catch. Dalton is obsessed with beating the smaller boats. The position's changing all the time. 12 hours ago, 58 miles behind him, from now 20 miles behind. We're 40 miles ahead of Tokyo. It's jockeying. It's going to be all the way to the wire. Hopefully the weather will suit us all the way in. Who knows? It's going to be anybody's race, but we're giving it as everything we can. Under the cover of darkness, Endeavour steals the show using the light air to their advantage. New Zealand Endeavour finishes first, breaking Steinlager's leg record by nearly two days. It's another line honour for Dalton, and the skipper is ecstatic. They crossed our stern last night about 12 o'clock by about 100 metres only. We got, you know, got away again. It's been, they've done it, so a really good race. Man, it's just been so hard. Interim finishes just five minutes later. Yeah, we're very pleased to beat the other guys, hopefully by five or six hours. You know, and um, that's where the race is at. You know, Grant's just cruising around on his own as far as I'm concerned. Getting in our way. As everybody keeps saying, you know, they're just a nuisance as far as we're concerned. You know, covering us all the way here. Laying all over our air all the time. I mean, they should be a lot faster, but they're not. But they just get in the way. Grant was covering us, but that wasn't our problem, you know. Our mission is to win the 60 class. Merritt lights up the night as she is third in. This crew hates to finish in daylight. And Tokyo is the fourth boat in, second in class. Her lead is still intact. It's not always fun to see a lead uh, eaten away up, but we do have a buffer where you, uh, times like now that it's been nice to have a little bit of a cushion. So Ventrum did a great job. She's gained on us, but sure, we're still in front. It's taken New Zealand Endeavour nearly 85 days to reach Punta, two days ahead of Merritt Cup. In the 60s, Interim has now become Tokyo's challenger, with Yamaha and Winston slipping back. Interim now holds that third spot and also set another new world 24-hour record. There is a cloud hanging over this resort town of Punta del Este as leg five approaches. Punta is buzzing over an international incident involving the Whitbread yacht La Paz. Four of La Paz crew are in jail for allegedly beating a man they surprised looting their house. Despite all diplomatic efforts, the men would not be released in time for the start. The Uruguayan authorities are definite about that. 
the yacht will continue shorthanded with the crew showing solidarity. The emphasis on this leg will be tactics. The goal, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. At the start, the Maxis lead out in the light going. It wouldn't last long, a low offshore was cycling northerlies. Strong winds on the nose. Hard on the wind, about 18 knots of breeze. Post speed, 9.8, 10 knots. So the wind's coming directly from where we want to go, which is normal. We have Intram about half a mile dead behind us. And we have Yamaha a little bit to windward and also behind. And the Maxi's well clear astern. We're starting to get sick of bashing away upwind already. No spinnakers yet. And on we go. As one, the fleet trim sheets and prepares for a rough ride. We've only got one t-shirt each, got one pair of one pair of shorts each, and some fairly thin oilies, and we're not really enjoying ourselves. Ride upwind into steep seas for several days. Tough on people, boats, and gear. Dolphin and Youth is one of several boats suffering delamination problems. As you can see here, this is where the delamination happened. Frack starts down here, goes all the way up here, and this area here was really, really flexing. This whole area here has to be cut out and a new section has to be The Corcovada welcomes Dolphin to Rio de Janeiro, another port of convenience where repair work could be done mid-race. Back at sea, Endeavour's constant pounding has loosened the hull's structural elements. The crew decides to run off briefly and make repairs while underway. They rip out bunks, and stiffen the hull from inside to keep the bow section from flexing. It seems to hold. Just six miles away, La Poste is having similar problems. Working on deck, all lifelines are clipped on. Lucky thing. Below, cracks appear in the bulkheads. Again, the bow section is flexing badly. As Skipper Taverly supervises, floorboards are strapped in place to stiffen the bow. The long slog to windward is rough on sailors. Grégoire Jacquet on Merritt Cup suffers a gash over his eye. And Nick Willits on Endeavour has his foot sewn together. What's happening here? All those screws sort of raised a little bit, Nick. Tokyo is toughing it out with the rest of the fleet, punching into waves and 25 knots, and then disaster. We were on the wind. It was about 8 o'clock in the evening, boat time, and we were just before. Some of the crew had just sat down below and were about to have something to eat. And I was in my bunk at the time, and the boat came very upright, which is a scary Thing at any time and um, there was a lot of feet running around and by the time I got to the hatch the word had come back of oh no it's the mast. It takes six hours much of it in the water for the crew to collect the broken mast and lash the pieces on deck. 
a jury rig takes the boat to Sao Paulo 285 miles north. There, they rebuild the rig and continue sailing while a new mast section is being shipped. They arrive at night and go straight to work on the new section. After all, they're still racing. minutes away from lifting the new mast up with the crane at the port. Everyone has been just fantastic. We're actually running ahead of schedule. We've made a new mast, pulled the old one apart, put it all together. And here we are, we've, two or three hours from now, we'll be on our way sailing again, about a week behind the leaders. Sailing up the coast toward the doldrums, interim stops as the fleet rushes past. For the second time in the Whitbread, the yacht sail into the doldrums. It's good for crew R and R, but not for sailing. This water is beautiful. I'll check them out. Here, the wind dies, leaving fickle patches of breeze and rain squalls that defy prediction. This is the beautiful, frustrating doldrums, where boat races are won and lost. One boat that doesn't stop here is Yamaha. Before the leg, Rossfield made a bold move by adding a meteorologist, Nick White, who spent the leg studying the weather full time and made a difference. Sitting 120 miles off the uh, Brazilian coast. Uh, we're in first place at the moment uh, in about 10 knots of breeze, light conditions, hoping to get into the trades in the next few days. And they have. Up ahead, the friendly Caribbean. They even had time for an equator crossing ceremony for Nick White. Well, well, Mo King. And, and what is his name? Nicholas White. Where is he? Oh, help, help me with him. He's committed crimes complaining of Gatchy's food. Ah! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Where is the slot bucket? <laughs> Yamaha's lead looks insurmountable, although the Maxis are coming on in lighter winds, their conditions. Further back on the course, for the second time in two legs, Heineken loses its runner. See you later. Bye, Rodder. Finally, the stately Fort Lauderdale beachfront came into view. Yamaha arrives in a tropical downpour to take loin and class honors. They wouldn't have cared if it was snowing. With help from Tokyo's broken mast, Yamaha takes over the fleet lead. I actually thought this would be a, a maxi leg, and um, I mean, it, it, it didn't concern me, but uh, you know, all indications were that this was their favoured leg. So. Um, you know, we sailed very well and, um, you know, I'm very happy with where we came in. More eye-catching pyrotechnics for Merritt, which takes its second Heineken trophy for winning the Maxi class. <laughs> Endeavour was close behind Merritt Cup. Let it go, Kiwi! <laughs> after we had the problem bow the boat with the delamination. We didn't lose that much out of that, but it put us on the wrong side of the weather patterns and we lost a lot. For interim, the leg is a big disappointment as Smith and crew are now ten and a half hours back. Well, we're a bit uh, disappointed in that, you know, we led the start of the race and uh, when uh, Tokyo fell out of it, then we were in very good shape, but um, these things happen in yacht racing. Don Riley and the women on Heineken get the biggest Fort Lauderdale welcome, complete with a message from the White House. From uh, Hillary Clinton, the wife of the President of the United States. And the message is to Skipper Don Riley, you and the crew are great role models for the young women of America. I'm overwhelmed, I guess, yeah. is what I'm saying. It's who would have thought that Washington would even take note of sailing 
four, five, ten years ago, and all of a sudden you get something like this, just for a silly little race that we're doing. A week later, Tokyo arrives. Their decision to finish the leg, commendable. But for Tokyo skipper Chris Dixon, whose dream of winning shattered. A numb feeling, a very numb feeling of it's, uh, the end is there. Merritt Cup has picked up nearly an hour on New Zealand Endeavour, but can't make the big gain. The Whitbread 60 scoreboard is a turnaround. Yamaha has grabbed a 10 and a half hour lead over interim. Tokyo slips to fifth with the mass break. No changes in the second half of the fleet, with Odessa 34 days behind Yamaha. New Zealand Endeavour regains the top spot, 11 hours and 43 minutes ahead of Yamaha. Merritt Cup is back to third. The boatyard is like a scene from MASH. Surgery is overbooked. The demon is delamination. The skin of the boat pulls away from the core material that provides strength. The cause? Constant pounding into big seas. The remedy? Cut it out and lay up a new section. Endeavor's tender spots are marked for the scalpel. Endeavour is set to win the maxi class, but skipper Grant Dalton also wants to be fastest round the world. Ross Field's Yamaha is close to victory in the 60 class. Field will be covering Laurie Smith on interim to make sure Smith doesn't find a private breeze. Leg six is tricky. Do you ride the meandering Gulf Stream current in a great circle or go looking for weather systems on the rum line? A tough call. At the start and 12 knots of wind, a short weather hitch up the beach as the boats jockeying in wind shifts, current and spectator wash. Interim rounds first and heads for England. Merritt Cup is next. A low pressure system ahead of the fleet is spiraling winds from the north, which means crash and bash towards New York. Merritt Cup makes a radical move east, out of the Gulf Stream, away from the fleet. For Pierre Fellman, it's all or nothing. Merritt and Brooksfield in the distance, he sheets and head offshore. Reebok and the rest stay hard on the wind in lumpy seas, playing the Gulf Stream. On Endeavour, the boys reef the main. Skipper Dalton is committed to the Gulfstream route, but nervous. Pretty worrying time. Who knows who's going to be right? I guess uh, we're going to find out in about three or four days. Wind against current makes for sloppy seas. Uncomfortable going in the Gulfstream. Crews hope for a wind shift and carry on. Meanwhile, Merritt and Brooksfield increase their lead to the east. Finally, the boats in the Gulfstream get their wind shift. On interim, sheets are eased. Speed increases. With the shift, the wind also drops as the boats exit the weather system. The wind continues to go aft. Spinnakers blossom. On board Yamaha, the crew changes to a better downwind chute. The 60s are having a battle royal in the Gulf Stream as three knots of current pushes them towards England. From the start, they've been locked together in sight of each other. The tension is rising. Merritt's crew is all smiles. They've been rolling like this from the start, developing a big lead. Will it last? From his look, Pierre Feldman has no doubts. The fleet enters the Grand Banks where thick fog often lies in ambush. For Merritt Cup and Brooksfield, the party is finally over. Robert Browning wrote of fog, fear death, to feel the fog in my throat, the mist in my face. Laurie Smith knows. Approaching um, quite a dangerous situation tonight. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of ice ahead. You can see from this iceberg scattered everywhere, and we're heading straight into them. So it's probably the, uh, the most um, nervous time for the crew since the beginning of the race. Thick fog outside, going about uh, 25 knots, so we're doing about 15 knots uh, boat speed, and our radar's not working very well. So everyone's been nervous, and um, people have probably been putting their life jackets on tonight so, and sleeping feet forward. Interim's Magnus Olsen works to repair the radar while the boat plunges blind, much too fast, into the unknown. An iceberg big as a house could be floating in Interim's path.
think we just passed the, the point where Titanic went down a few years ago. Two days ago, we hit a whale. Quarter of an hour after that, we missed a 20 foot container by about the same distance. And then last night, in this thick fog, visibility about 200 feet, this iceberg rolls out of the mist, not more than a boat length away. About 60 foot high, 150 foot long. Bit of a worry, really. The fleet sails out of the fog without incident. But this is the Whitbread, and there is no rest. Coming up, gale force winds. And what a gale, 40 to 50 knots out of the west, mercilessly driving the fleet towards England at breakneck speeds. The leaders terrified of breakdowns. The challengers going for broke. For all, it's a maelstrom, a final test of weary sailors and tired boats. Galicia's rooster tail at 25 knots is extraordinary. They're on an Atlantic roller coaster ride. The boss rides the gale, but not without problems. The boss bowed to laminated in leg five. Once again, the crew rigs braces and hopes they will hold. By now, Intrum's struggle to catch Yamaha is becoming futile, but don't tell that to the sailor. With nothing to lose and pride on the line, Tokyo's crew pushes hard. During the gale, master helmsman Chris Dixon shows how it's done. A westbound tanker pushes into huge seas. From the bridge, they get a great view of Endeavour. But Grant Dalton knows the 60s are planing, leaving the maxi behind. We're just passing a tanker bashing into huge seas. The humans were running with it. It's come pretty wild out here. We can't hold the 60s, but we're still flying. Still flying, trying to keep up, do the best we can. For some of the 60s, the gale was too much of a good thing. Brooksfield looked like it sailed through an egg beater. The sails were in tatters. The main battens fractured from a jibe that knocked the boat on its side. Broken parts littered the boat. Heineken weaves an erratic course into the English Channel. The boat has suffered its third rudder problem in the race. Uruguay Natural passed their spare rudder on a line buoyed with life jackets. Dawn Riley's resourceful crew modified the gift to fit their transom. It worked for a while, but it too started to pull off the stern. So a rendezvous was arranged off Falmouth, with the Heineck and Shaw crew helped attach Brooksfield Spear. Good enough to get them home this time. Kudos for Tokyo's gutty crew, winning line honors after a disheartening leg five dismasting. Tokyo sailed the last 120 miles in six hours, a 21 knot average. To have the mast break was devastating, of course, but to, uh, to have finished with a win, to have won uh, three of the six legs is uh, a pleasing result for us, and we're very, very happy. A great victory for Tokyo, Gary, and Winston finishes second, sailing an excellent tactical race. So we placed the boat a bit better. Uh, we sailed it as hard as we ever did, and it was just, you know, a few of the brakes were now away, and it was a good leg. Yamaha is third and winning her class with a consistent performance. A great job. And these 360s lead Endeavour in. The uh, worry of damage, you know, I really was concerned about it. So uh, we did button back a little bit. Um, and uh, Winston and Tokyo sailed very well and just sailed around us. But um, we're here, we've got it, you know, fantastic. Grant Dalton wanted to be first to Southampton, but he's done it, winning the maxi class and fastest round the world, smashing Steinlager 2's record. We won. It's, it's going to take a while to sink in. You know, it's, the last 24 hours have been a real battle. We knew that we, the 60s were going to get the legs on us. We, I kept trying to keep thinking of the big picture. You know, we could break the boat. 
and yeah, they're there. I just, it's amazing. Dalton has been obsessed with beating the 60s round the world. At Dockside, he let fly. They're gutted. They're absolutely fuming that they got beaten by us. Most of them built 60 footers to be fastest around the world. I mean, why else would you do the race? I mean, I can't see any reason to go around the world to get beaten in by somebody else. It makes no sense. I mean, it's the 90s. Speed is the essence. And, and you know, I know that they'll do everything they can to weasel, weasel their way out of it. But they're not happy boys at all. And, you know, they made bad calls. They built 60s to, beat, to be first around the world, and they weren't. So tough, tough luck to them. They got it wrong. Do I look gutted? Really? No, I'm not. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, Grant is still on this thing, pushing the old wheelbarrow down the garden path. You know, he spent three years trying to make us slower so that he would win, and he's won. He, he should be very happy with the result, and uh, I'm happy. My crew are very, very happy. Yamaha are happy. You know, we're ecstatic about it, and um, good on Grant for coming in here. He's won the max season, we won the 60s. Interim finished second in the Whitbread 60 class with a strong showing and a new world record but a frustrated Lobby Smith. The boat actually is not good in light weather, you know, and the, the first leg is very light, light weather. Uh, every, every time the wind drops, we park up. I mean, we do less miles than anybody. And uh, when it's strong winds, we do more miles than anybody. So there's something a bit peculiar there, and it's not in the design. It's just um, maybe it's our sails, I don't know. Merritt took a gamble on this leg and lost, but remains a solid second in the maxi class. For skipper Pierre Fellman, it was an interesting clash of the classes. Well, Mark, she are faster in light wind, the 60 are faster in uh, heavy wind. When uh, you have moderate wind, we have the same speed, but uh, all together on the, on the race, we were all, most of the time together, so it's, it was a nice and interesting race with two different kind of boats. What a race! The new 60 class has shown us incredible speeds. We should mention that Bruce Farr designed eight of these new boats and two of the Maxis. And some amazing feats of seamanship have been displayed. The Whitbread safety system gets high marks. If there is a weak spot, it's boat construction. It's a Grand Prix event now, Peter. One that requires a lot of skippers and crews. Next time, there will only be Whitbread 60s, with several ports in contention for a change of course. Gary, the Whitbread is such an ordeal. One question remains. Why do they do it? Let's ask them. Oh, the Whitbread means to me uh, exciting sailing from uh, probably the start in Southampton until we finish there, uh, sailing right around the world, and a, a competition and adventure. That's what the whole race is about. It means, uh, oh my God, do I have to go and do that again? Yeah. Sail the Whitbread, it's a course uh, fantastic. It was a great adventure. It's a little bit more an adventure, but now it's a course on board, on board, that... It's a difficult race, but it's uh, also a big challenge. And I think in the end, you don't realize in the beginning, but in the end, you've made a lot of good friends. It embodies everything that is, is the sense of living. You know, everything that you do in your life, you do in this sort of four-year period. For me, it, it is the ultimate, um, Whitbread is the ultimate uh, thrill for, for, that I can do. Good question. Oh. <laughs>